today's seminar, hosted by the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. My name is Kirsten Sainbrook. I am the British Academy Global Professor at the IRI and a Distinguished Press Policy Fellow. I'm incredibly pleased to be chairing today's seminar entitled Analyzing Intergenerational Mobility with Oriented Measures and Mobility Curves, which is part of the IAI Inequalities Seminar Series. Today's speaker is Professor James Foster. James Foster is the Oliver T. Carr Jr. Professor of International Affairs and Professor of Economics at George Washington University and also a research associate at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, known to most of us as OFI. He is also a visiting professor at the LSE Inequalities Institute. And James, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. Finally, we've been waiting for a long time to be able to bring you over. So before we start, may I ask our online audience to please keep yourselves muted. And as usual, there'll be a chance to ask questions and take questions both from the room after James's presentation and also from the online questions. So with that, I now hand over to you, James. Thank you, Kristen. Really great. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. Um, Tony Shorrocks is sitting in the back of the room. He's the first person that invited me to the London School of Economics 40 years ago, almost to the term, right? <laughs> uh, it was, in fact. And uh, I remember giving a talk called the axiomatic, uh, axiomatization of the tile income inequality measure without warts. That was the name of the talk at that point. But it's really great to be back here. And in fact, again, in sabbatical uh, 40 years later. Today, uh, let me just jump right in here and make sure everything works beautifully. My typical, the stuff I usually do has to do with distribution, the size, spread, or base of a distribution, and how all those things relate to one another. I usually focus on unidimensional, uni but more recently have done some multidimensional work. Uh, here's the picture that usually motivates these three aspects of the distribution, the size, you know, there's the mean, how far is that CDF to the right, uh, often measured with what might be called an income standard or represented income, spread kind of looks at B and A and see how big they are relative to that mean. And the base focuses on what's going on over on that side, the poverty side. All are fundamentally linked to stochastic dominance and hence welfare. Intergenerational mobility, I didn't touch, I wouldn't even think about getting into. Uh, I, it's very disconnected from the other parts of distributional analysis, and I've avoided up till now. Um, there are a lot of unrelated approaches that sort of are here and there and not linked to each other, um, not grounded in the other lit in the sort of literatures that I'm coming from. It's really no core ranking. It says this is unambiguously more mobility. Right? And uh, what's the link to welfare is really an important part of it where I come from. I want to know what's good about it, right? So that I can get in front of policymakers and say, go this way. John Rothbaum is my co-author of the Census Bureau. You can imagine why it would be good to have a co-author at the Census Bureau, uh, but it's actually from his thesis, uh, which he did a few years back, and a couple of other papers. The name of the paper, I don't still in the process of putting together the name. As Tony will say, uh, wait another few years and it'll be done because he's been my co-author and he knows how long it takes to write papers. <laughs> yes, that's right. So goals. The goal of this paper is to develop alternative, intuitive measures of what I call oriented mobility, upward and downward mobility provide a kind of basic axiomatic framework for understanding them and define what I call the mobility curve. There's a lot of mobility curves out there, but this one is analogous more to the Lorenz or the poverty uh, curve, um, representing unanimity rankings of measures. So just like the Atkinson approach, we have all these inequality measures, where do they agree? Lorenz, that's what I'm after with this. And to illustrate with some practical applications, First, though, let me just have a quick, very brief go through with the sort of existing approaches. We had a wonderful presentation just a week ago. Flaviana uh, went through her approach, which is, I believe, related to what I'll be talking about here 
to some extent, but since I was away in Dublin, I haven't had a chance to look at the paper and to go through and compare them. Uh, first, intergenerational elasticity of income. Uh, it's the coefficient data from the regression of log income of children on the log of parents. It's really the most common approach. It's also broken down in interesting ways by folks, but the intuition is 1% higher. Parent income is this much on average uh, more for kids. So the estimate given for US is given below. Uh, if a family is poor, then on how average, uh, how soon will that family re regress to the mean? It's the other way of looking at it. There are a lot of references, a lot of people use this. Let me move on to shortcomings. Uh, the average misses a lot of action. Um, and this is an example my co-author noted that the very ex ex changes observed in the U.S. of the last bunches of years for Hispanics and whites could be associated with higher, lower, or no change in the IG. So it doesn't really point out what's happening a lot of times. Uh, it's also problematic because there are misleading results for, for subgroups. I mean, IGE for Blacks in the U.S. and Whites in the U.S. is the same. Hey, same mobility, great thing. The problem is, is that your, your, your movement to the mean in the case of Blacks is far lower mean than for Whites. So the fact that there is equal, quote, mobility is very different in terms of well-being, in terms of the actual lived lives of people in the U.S., Blacks versus Whites. Uh, and it's not decomposable. So how do you do policy analysis? I mean, decomposability is pointed out in the early works by Tony and Francois Guignon and lots of other folks. You need some form of decomposability to be able to know where things are coming from. All right. So we move to transition vacancies, uh, defining classes or groups, and estimating the probabilities of going from one to the other captures the distribution of movements now, a good thing, not just the average. Um, it explicitly separates outcomes of children from poor and wealthy families because you can come down over here to the lower group, see what the probability is moving up into which uh, particular category and down, of course. So it's, it's quite helpful. These things are hidden if you use ID. Many, many people have used this in their Stoney's paper from your thesis, I think, uh, which is he heading that up. Our coming is that you're starting with censored data, really. I mean, you're forgetting any movement inside the, the, uh, the categories, the cells, uh, and arbitrary thresholds, which we know that if you're a little below and you move up a very small amount, you get above that cutoff, and it registers. Whereas massive changes within the cutoff don't. So there's a nagging question always is this due to the cutoff or is it due to actual mobility? There's also one aspect that I guess uh, Tony could speak to better than me. There's kind of not agreement on what the headline would be for transition agency. What's the measure that says there's more mobility, less mobility, that some types of indices, uh, indices you can get by adding up cells and so on? But many people talk about it and many people argue about it. Uh, finally, Gary Fields and a number of other folks have looked on uh, average distance measures of mobility. It's kind of the overall flux to what's happening with incomes from child to from parents to child. Uh, there's no arbitrary cutoffs. That's good. And it has headline. I mean, the whole point is to create a measure that's a headline. The shortcomings. So that it is flux. So that means downward and upward are seen as the same and equally good in this world. Uh, the quality of mobility is really not analyzed. And it's not helpful for identifying groups benefiting, if you will, from mobility. And that's something you really want to be able to have a sense of. Now, I see the first on the list is Frank Powell's paper, which actually I had a lot of time talking with about when I was here visiting the last time. So um, our concept of mobility is based on the very simple notion. I think it's behind many, many measures of mobility, but not as explicit as ours. Will my child be able to do better than me? If so, how much better? If not, then how much worse? But that's, that's the core concept that I'm starting with. They call it the American dream. It's also the dream everywhere else. Like many, many people have this in common. So in order to grasp this, I developed oriented distance-based measures. 
outward versus downward mobility. The key, of course, is what the variable is, and there are many choices for what you could use as variables. Here, I'm going to focus on absolute mobility and use income, assuming it can be made comparable across the generations. Again, we can talk about that, but that's a different question. Um, the persons who I saw first use uh, absolute measures of mobility in this standard literature are listed there. It has since taken off. Many people look at the head count of upward mobile group, and we'll talk about that as the measure later on down the pike. So here's my notations. So panel is basically a pair of the parents and kids, parents in X, kids in Y. Each family is indicated by I. So the parent-kid relationship is a dyad. Notice this is stylized. How you get there is half the story, but I'm not <laughs> going to spend a lot of time going through that. I'm looking at the measurement per se. Incomes have to be linked and comparable, meaning that I, you should be able to see and compare across the parent and kid. Um, most distributional analyses, that used to, like on the page when I started out, are anonymous data. So you don't connect across time. This is a really big assumption because the incomes of parents and kids are usually through many, many years and comparing the two is in itself an issue. Ideally, children and parents should be at the same age, maybe for many years below or above, you take uh, a range or take averages. Uh, Steve Durloff uh, actually looked at uh, now he's trying to separate out the kind of averages that are used to see uh, step by step at each age how different having more money at different ages affects the well being of kids. So he's some really interesting stuff coming out from Steve. Um, Stephen. Uh, panels are, of course, notoriously hard to come by. We all know that, hence my co author census. Um, other variables could be used. I mean, schooling. Indicator of occupation, maybe health status. I mean, they kind of have to be cardinal in my discussion, but I'll show you a way in which we can finesse it and talk about uh, ordinals when we have the curves. Uh, you can also look at relative income level, which would be compared to the mean of the group, contemporaneous. That doesn't capture what we're trying to capture because do I really care how I am relative to the average of my group? Ask most people, they don't know the average of the group. So that is an absolute approach to be able to compare across countries. I get it. <laughs> I know that trick, but we're going to talk about within a country a little bit more. This makes it more possible. Um, also, percentile or rank is possible as well. But much of what I'll be doing with distance doesn't work there, but the curves work. Any variable that can be plausibly compared across generations makes sense. So a dyad could be, in fact, if I wanted to rethink of the, this for mobility through time for the same person, it could be done, but it's just a little bit different in interpretation and doesn't have quite the force. So a mobility measure is just a mapping M from a set of all panels to the real numbers, where M of P is interpreted as the level of mobility associated with the panel P. The idea is that you use this to compare different panels, and it could be Panels through time, through space, through groups. It could also be lead to an incomplete notation. For instance, uh, incomplete criteria. For instance, we might say, well, when do all these measures that are reasonable agree? Or maybe there's some intuition like with the Lorentz curve. It said, heck, if it's the share going to the lowest x is higher for every time we look at a different population. Wow that would mean less inequality. So that's unambiguous as its motivation for the curve. We'll talk about that a little bit later on the down the line. So here's the motivating example. It's Gary Fields gap measure, if you want to call it. Uh, he just looks at the gap between kids and parents absolute value and averages of across all families. All right, so you can see what that's measuring. Uh, mobility is kind of the ab absolute movement or gap between parent and child averaged up. Alternative measure says, no, wait a minute, maybe we should take a transformation of the income. So if you're you know, every economist, this seems very natural, take a log. And indeed, the literature does have a lot of logs in it. So, uh, and look at the average difference in logs. 
in general, this would emphasize the lower end more because the slope is bigger there and the flat at the top. But depending on how you'd like to do it, you could do this transformation of income to something else, right? The V function uh, could be a measure of utility, I mean, whatever you want to call it. In any case, uh, this is a general class of distance measures that uh, Fields and Oak and many other people have looked at. The idea is to transform first by this V and then find the average movement in the transform variable. The properties for the transformation matter because you don't want to go up with income and then go down in the uh, indicator that V measures. So V prime greater than zero is natural. V double prime less than zero is also natural if you think of stochastic dominance, but I won't go there yet by assuming it. I'll simply say that's later as well. So we'll assume this and move on. Now, axioms. These are properties for measures of mobility. I call axioms nuggets of policy. Why do I do that? Because it sort of identifies the way you want the measure if you go. I want it to move down if it's inequality or poverty. I really want it to go down if it's poverty. And so I have an axiom that says this change lowers poverty. I also want to explain what it is that I'm not interested in. Those are what are called invariance axioms. And it's like saying, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. I don't care if you change the names of people or if you replicate, it doesn't matter. That's not what I'm measuring. I want to measure this. And subgroup axioms allow a lot of you know, policy analysis to take place, linking subgroup people, sometimes even subgroups of dimensions, depending on whether you're looking at unidimensional or multidimensional. Here's a property, or it will be a property in just a second. A permutation of families, right, has occurred here. Just look at the colors. I've just permuted them, given them the different name. One, two, three becomes, well, three is over here. One becomes three. Two is one, et cetera. You get the point. So that's a permutation, just multiplying by a permutation matrix, but it's easier to see intuitively. And an immunity axiom says, hey, if that happens, I don't care. It isn't going to affect my idea of what mobility is because whoever it is uh, has which name doesn't matter. Okay. By the way, you can't switch a kid separately, right? You can't keep the parent and then go, oops, I switched the kid. Changes mobility, potentially. Second, a replication of families, and this should be familiar with all of you knowing inequality measures in my work in 84, which takes the basic three or four properties of inequality measures. Replicate, just clone each person, boom, you get this, this uh, panel. And looking at the two, there should be no difference in, in mobility. Uh, and this allows you to compare different size company, uh, countries or groups of people. Otherwise, if you didn't satisfy this property, it would be per capita, and it would be something that a big country could have much more mobility just because it had more people. So here's the replication of variance axiom. That is not what we're after. We're not trying to measure the number of people. Okay, so now you can compare across different groups. Decomposability axiom. This one is similar to the poverty decomposability, you know, between group term, it's within group. And it says that if you have a panel here and a panel here, which are combined over here, right, then the overall mobility is just the population weighted average of the individual mobilities. Does that make sense? So this would be quite a helpful way of thinking about right, mobility, because uh, you could then look at different groups see how each of them would contribute to overall, overall uh, mobility. You'll notice that I almost said poverty there. That happens. So the idea uh, is that you get a weighted average of the individual groups to get the overall, and this is analogous to DFGT poverty measures. Now comes the dominance axiom, and this is the core of the issue. It says, uh, we say that uh, E prime is obtained from P, <laughs> which is a different panel than E prime, by an upward expansion if, well, first of all, for this person, this family I, it must have gone up or at least stayed the same. So it must be upward mobility, at least in a weak sense. And then in the new panel, there's a larger distance, either the 
fin goes up or the parent goes down. Example here, the original panel, in this case, the five of the kid became seven. In this case, the three of the parent went down to two. Both of those are called an upward expansion, expansion of upward mobility, if you will. Okay. Downward expansion, analogous downward movement. What happened here was that the kids income went, was already going down, there's downward mobility, but now we've been going down further. Parents started at a higher level, so there's less downward. Okay, uh, we said that P prime is made by a downward expansion of this holds, and the expansion axiom says, no matter where it goes, up or down, there's greater mobility. <laughs> If P prime is obtained from P by an upward or a downward expansion, then mobility should go up. So any change that increases the movement is increasing mobility. This is the key property for those MV distance measures. No question about it. So MV obviously satisfies all of those axioms uh, where the classification of the axioms are given in this discussion below. Okay. And do I need to show it to you? Of course not, because easily uh, the, the um, first two of anonymity and replication variance is obvious from the average format of the measures. You can see decomposability quite easily. And the upward expansion intuitively you can tell how that different is going to go up with the one with the expansion versus the old one. Critique of MV is that, well, those two panels have the same measure of mobility, let's say by G, because we have an increase by two between parent and kid in the first person, the second person. That's great. Or we have a decrease by two. Which one has greater mobility? Both are the same according to G, but aren't they fundamentally different? Should we acknowledge that and work? in that realm. The problem is MD doesn't distinguish between upward and downward mobility. You need oriented measures to do that. So let's define some. MU is an upward uh, mobility measure. MD is downward mobility measure. And MO denotes either of those, depending on what I'm defining. So that way, I don't have to keep redefining everything in terms of upward and downward. I can do it in terms of O. What are the key properties of oriented measures? The first three are unchanged. The final one, the expansion, needs to be adapted. A property for upward mobility axioms would be if P prime is obtained from P by an upward expansion, then mobility strictly rises. By a downward expansion, no change. So I just ignore what's going on in the downward. I'm only focusing on upward. This is an upward expansion, and we're going to be using this to set a new axiom. Downward axiom, same thing. Downward expansion axiom. Uh, if P prime is obtained by a downward expansion, then mobility should rise. Otherwise, upward, no change. Does all that make sense? Okay. How do you construct these oriented measures? Well, this is inspired by the poverty stuff that I've worked in. Identify who's upward and who's downward, and then use the data to kind of construct and aggregate to get a measure. So I identify who's upward, downward movers, and then define or aggregate to get an overall indicator. So identification is, right, you can see from the data. And therefore, the set of upward movers is where kids have higher, and I'm going to make it strictly higher here. It could be equal. I mean, you did overlap, but it would be an irrelevant overlap. It's usually measure uh -huh. zero almost. So kids have higher than parents. Downward movers, parents have higher than kids. And those are the QD and uh, QU. Simplest example of aggregation isn't one of those distance measures, it's the headcount ratio. <clears throat> And it would say, well, let's look at the number 
where Q is just a number of folks in the upward movers. Therefore, Q, U would be the number of upward movers in the data and place it over the total number of people. So the percentage who go up would be HU, the percentage who fall would be HD. Obviously, the sum of those is approximately one, so one is good enough in that case. Entirely analogous to the headcount ratio. So, for example, we have two folks down, one family up, and all the data are given here with the upward headcount ratio being a third, downward headcount ratio being two thirds. All makes sense, correct? They're useful indicators, these headcounts, but they're also quite crude. Uh, they convey a lot of meaningful information about mobility. In fact, I think the Q actually the sets convey a lot more information about mobility. Um, they satisfy all the measures except for upward expansion, downward expansion, barely failing them, just like the headcount ratio barely satisfied, failed monotonously. So in order to change that, we might add in a little bit of information about the gap, the size of the gap. Sound familiar? So the income gap, oriented income gap between parent and kid on average is given by IO. So IO is the average distance for all those that are moving in the particular direction, right? Where you measure the difference between kids and parent. And multiply this income gap by the headcount ratio, and you get the oriented mobility gap, analogous to the poverty gap. All right, so the GO is a basic measure. Quite interesting and quite simple, but it tells you something. So for this example of going from uh, a panel, we have the one group with an average income increase of two, right? So the oriented income gap is two. Headcount ratio is one third, so GU, the Upward gap is two thirds. Likewise, you get a downward gap of two thirds in this case. All very simple and makes sense. By the way, G0, the original G, if you will, right? Which is not the G. So that's, this is the definition of G0. The original G didn't restrict yourself to people going up or down, but was everyone. And so actually the sum of these two upward and downward wind up being equivalent to the first, you know, fields measure, uh, the gap measure. So mobility gap is the sum of the oriented mobility gaps. And by the way, you can also go in the other direction. So let me show you how to do oriented measures from general measures. So, um, for any given panel, let's let the kids have their actual incomes if they're going in the right direction. But for kids going in the wrong direction, we're gonna give the parents' income to them. So they just stay in the parents' income, no difference. This is called a sensor panel associated with P in the direction O. So X and then this oriented panel or headed uh, parent distribution will give you the panel. Idea, you're censoring all the moves in the wrong direction. Right. <laughs> so just to notice <laughs> what's going on here, we're censoring downward movements for EU, we're censoring upward movements. So that yeah. kind of makes sense. So if I apply the Overall gap that Fields and Oaks use to this, the censored uh, panels, you get the appropriate oriented measure. So that's one way of moving in the other direction. It yields a method of creating an oriented measure from a usual measure. By the way, it goes beyond the MVs or the Ms. You can go into general way of thinking about it by censoring out what's happening in the downward movers to get upward mobility. So the oriented mobility measure associated with them is defined this way. If you started with a measure that satisfied the original expansion axiom, then they're going to get the right expansion axiom out of the 
oriented measure. I'm going to focus on oriented measures associated with MVs, these distance measures. Okay. By the way, there's a nice welfare interpretation of V, the transformation that relates to utility, which of course Tony Atkinson never would relate that to utility. It's, a, it's some social evaluation function. But anyway, transformation B could be, it's just a rescaling of income, but it could be reviewed as a welfare function. Then greater oriented mobility could be reinterpreted in terms of welfare. How? Well, if one panel has higher upward mobility, then the intergenerational improvement in welfare was higher in people. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Just before you get into this, I think it's <clears throat> going to take us a little bit away from <clears throat> what I wanted to ask, which was obviously, you know, Fields and Oak also had directional measures. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're emphasizing the, the non directional measures they had, but they also wrote down, well, I could also take out these. Uh, absolute values. And so it seems to me that, just to see if I understood, so you're, the way you define NU and MD, they're both positive quantities. Yes, sir. So when you add them, you get the non-direction. Yep. If you subtract the, the downward, then you get, up, but you get the direction. Mm -hmm. that they do. It seems like an interesting, you know, what does that, what is that measuring the net? So I'm not doing that. You're not doing. Nope. Your your key thing by emphasizing, you know, these um, these blocking outs is to separate the quantities of movement up and down. Exactly. And why do you think that's better than taking the net? Well, net mixes it back up. That's the problem. And so when you're taking the net, the way that they do it, they focus on a combination of the two that then focuses. And puts it all back together again. I'm trying to separate and get a sense because the downward mobility, I don't know about you, but downward mobility to me is something we have to put up with, but which we don't necessarily like in this context of absolute movements. But you can think about that, okay? If we're doing relative, of course, it would be quite natural and you have to have it. Okay, so if this occurs, then the Intergenerational improvement in welfare as measured by B is higher in P prime than in P. If downward mobility is greater, then the intergenerational loss in welfare is higher in P prime than in B. Focusing your attention only on the direction for that population. And I do an average of the entire population just to keep it so everything is consistently over N as opposed to the smaller sets. <laughs> By the way, if N is the same, what time do we have? Because I, I include this if I have enough time. If I don't, if I don't. It's 12.25. 12.25? 35. 35. Oh, well, I don't know if I can. I'll just briefly describe this. If you, uh, if you have this being discrete with the same number of families, then it's really quite interesting. You take the parents from this, combine it with the kids from this, the kids from this and the parents of this construct these intergenerational distributions. It's really quite interesting because you can say something consistently about welfare uh, in comparing this to this. And I won't get into it right now, but that's quite an unusual thing. In fact, it has to do with first order passive dominance. Okay. So the following are equivalent. Uh, if we have higher mobility, according to than the aggregate welfare in the internet. You know, so that's the result that I don't want to talk about. Now, when will all distance measures, our oriented distance measures agree? Well, that will be a kind of unanimity ranking. I want to justify it in terms of actually an uh, kind of intuitive ranking that's based on a curve. And I'll explain the curve in just a moment. Clearly, this unanimity ranking will depend on what we allow. I've assumed B prime greater than zero and comes transformed in a strictly increasing way. I define the upward mobility curve as follows. <laughs> I'll just show it as a picture. Take any cutoff, Z, and we look at the numbers, the percentage actually, that cross between kids 
parents and kids. So parents are on this side, kids are on this side. Percentage of the population that crossed at that cutoff. And move that cutoff a little to the left or the right. Move it and graph. That's called the mobility curve in our terminology. And you can imagine that if there's more upward mobility, I mean, you have higher percentages of movement upwards, it's an unambiguous increase in mobility in an intuitive sense. Okay? This is motivated by poverty dynamics. This picture, obviously, where parents, right, go up to get upward mobility, down, downward mobility, crossing over, I can define a mobility curve upward and or downward separately. Yes, go ahead. I'm just wondering, yeah. if you're using absolute values in this, are, are you just sort of- uh, Yes, but the one direction, it allowed me to find both oriented in the same phrase. Yeah, but I'm all. wondering to what extent this is really just picking up on economic growth. So if the children are living in a, you know, 20 years, 30 years down the line, uh, the, the state, the country they're living in has has grown economically. There's a lot more wealth. Indeed, that can be the case. That just pushes yes. everything up. So in that sense, can be. you might expect to see. And it can be a spread as well at the same time, or it could be a shift downward, yeah. or one group isn't having it occur, and you can pick that out through the subgroup analysis. Yeah, but I guess my question is whether we really want to think about that as social mobility, because you could have 70% of a population socially like mobile in that sense. Whereas Wouldn't it be wonderful? It would be wonderful. But like, aren't we also interested in, the? are we, I don't know, in my mind. Many <laughs> are interested because you want to know where it seems that parent, that kids are able to these kids are able to move up, these are not. Why? What's what's going on? Mm. Right? And these kids are doing very well. These are not. What is the factors? And, and parents obviously have a big a, an important role to play in that. That's part of what you're sussing out through potentially through ranks. So doing a rank or doing a relative income <laughs> analysis can be quite useful for those sorts of things. But I'm looking at the actual core feeling parents might have. Will my kids be able to do better than me? But I think James <clears throat> Hiller is getting at the same thing I was, which is you want the net. Right? So, uh, Hiller, when you were asking this question, I think you were getting at the same thing I was trying to get at, which is the net. You, you want the, the, the growth that you're going to get is going to be the difference between all the people moving up. Mm -hmm. well, I don't think it's uninteresting to look at the two separate. But if you're going to look, if you're going to compare, as you said, you want to compare two periods of time or two countries, right? Are you going to tell a policymaker, well, in this country, I've got more upward mobility than in that country? I've also or in that region or in that state or yeah. that city? Yeah. Like what is done in the current mobility they, literature. So that's a good thing. Yep. And then they'll say to you, well, but I also have much more downward mobility, <laughs> which is a bad thing. And then what would you say to them? Right? Well, I would say right now that we're not noting the downward mobility in the literature. We're not. We yeah. tend not to. Well, I think what Gary Fields would say is to subtract the downward from the upward and you have the real answer. What's the wealth? What, what are the welfare implications? I mean, are you really going to do it one for one? Maybe it should be three for one, but they're two separate entities. That's the important one. You could have your transformation new. Yeah. yeah. But still have the next. What do you explain what that would be? Yeah. Meaning that you would treat, you would treat, you you would have the same curvature on any movement, but you would still have the downwards, the upward minus the downward. You could subtract the two curves, and I'm not stopping you from doing those sorts of things. But my goal here is to separate them and to note that there is a separate thought process that goes for down versus up. And yes, it does relate to growth. And it relates to inequality and the inequality in the insurance distribution has a huge impact. So there's many factors that have impacts, but I want to just measure. That's what I'm after. Documenting it. So here's the picture, and you might imagine this said varying to get. I mean, we did with poverty measures. This is a similar thing for mobility. So this usually can builds itself right before your eyes. Uh, imagine in the Z1 case, it's 10,000 and 20% of the population crosses from below. Plot it and 
grid Z2 of 12.5, there's 18% plotted. You see how it's being constructed. It's really easy to understand how it's being constructed and what it means. Okay. All right. So we say that P prime dominates P according to the upward mobility curve. And I'm going to focus on the upward mobility curve. You can do the same for the downward as well. If you know, it is higher, or at least um, strictly higher in some place, but no, no lower in any place. We denote this as P prime CU P. Easy to graph, reminds you of a Lorentz curve or poverty curves. Result, the following are equivalent, that P prime CUP, the mobility curve is higher, if and only if the directional mobility, directional distance mobility is higher for all possible transformations. If and only if the intergenerational improvement of welfare Iron P prime and P. So this is sort of my main result, linking it to the well-being, linking it to the measures and a unanimity ranking of all three. Same thing can be done for downward. Uh, plus we have that extra result for the discrete case with same numbers of people. I won't mention it here. By the way, we've assumed cardinal variables. Do we need to assume cardinal variables? Great question. Mobility curve approach applies to ordinal variables. There's no reason why we have to have a cardinal um, because we're just looking at proportions as whatever the variable is, it's different and changes. Your interpretation could be that V is a monotonic transformation of some ordinal variable. It's a cardinalization. And all you're doing is working through all the different cardinalizations. But if the mobility curve dominance holds, then for every cardinalization, you're going to see the same result, more mobility. And this generalizes previous work that was mentioned last time, the work with Allison. Allison is essentially, Allison Foster is essentially take the median and move downward at a stochastic dominance downward from below and upward from above, and it leads to more inequality. So it's first order dominance both ways. If you used, instead of the parent's income in the function here. You use the median children's income for that cohort. You would get directly Allison and Foster. So the difference is you're using the parent as the standard as opposed to the median of the contemporaneous group. And the same thing could be said for the polarization stuff with um, Wilson. Okay. All right, so this links back to that literature on inequality in an ordinal variable. You can define the downward mobility curve. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, I can do it all for V prime less than zero. Uh, the key issue that I see is this conflict between downward and upward. Wouldn't families prefer upward, of course? Getting back to the question, these are all the tools that are available from this headcount. The G and the L measures with logs. You have mobility curves for robustness. Mobility comparisons can be at overall and for salient subgroups. Uh, decomposability is obviously useful here. And then even going to profile of mobility with cues, overlaying different groups that you're of interest, right? So going almost to opportunity discussions and mobility discussions. Identifying characteristics that go along with upward and downward mobility. Well, that's it. Uh, these are some mobility curves. I don't have time to really go through what they mean, but we have uh, mobility for two years in US. Upwards, we put the downward downward. Um, I'll have this available for folks if you're interested in seeing the kinds of mobility curves we say, but you can see intuitively what they're about. This is separated by quintiles for parents. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. And we had a counterfactual example that shifted around the parents to make sure that they looked the same between blacks and whites and saw that you can make comparisons across the mobility curves at that point. So we've done oriented uh, mobility curves, linked it to welfare and stochastic dominance, other applications, and maybe multidimensional. That's it for today. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, James. That was great.
So I'm going to open up the floor to questions first from within the room. Do you have a preference in terms of whether you'd like to gather questions? No, I don't like gathering questions. I love answering them immediately and moving on. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we very quick. And because we also have to answer some questions from online, assuming that there are online questions. Yes, I want to fill it. Okay. Amina? Thanks, James. Yes, please. Um, so my question is, as a, if, if a policymaker approaches you, yes. what would you tell them from your research? Like, what's the main thing they should be doing or not? Well, I mean, I think I can't tell what the, the policymaker what to do right now because I haven't looked at the data to find out what is what are the characteristics associated with this public movement. I mean, many people have started doing that, and some of Chetty's work has been doing that already with the kind of headcount types. But then knowing these big movers, who are they? Okay. Right? And who are the big losers over periods of time? It's really important to know those sorts of things. And particularly, I think the Chetty's approach with geography is really important for a place like US because the Midwest is well known to have the issues, some in the South, but I mean, even among different groups within the regions, you get totally different pictures of what's going on in terms of mobility, hence the decomposability is needed there. So I think the headline that you obtain is a great motivator, mm -hmm. the upward mobility or the downward mobility is a headline. And then the policy analysis analysis has to be nuanced. It can't be a simple thing and it has to be driven by. by. So I can't tell the policymaker yet okay. because in the current situation, don't know. But it is the case. I mean, there's no question that we can just see immediately that as with everything in the US, Blacks versus whites is a very salient political and uh, actual question to, to ask. And you can see what's going on already through a variety of ways of looking at mobility, but it'd be really interesting to make it more tangible. What I want is a number that makes sense to policymakers. And I think this could make sense to policymakers, especially the gap. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I was um, <clears throat> just at the end when you were looking, you didn't have time to look at these graphs. Yes. You apply these to some numbers. What sort of do you have one particular conclusion that you've drawn from these numbers? We well, sample or illustrate. Well, in the in that things have gotten worse in terms of the uh I mean you in terms of right, recent yeah. generations in the US versus older generations, you could see pretty straightforwardly how you're not having the same mobility. Uh that's exactly what the matching many other conclusions, but not all, because you have many relative conclusions that say nothing's happened, nothing's changed. Well, Absolute, you so need to life. differentiate out what's really happening. Go ahead. Follow up from my 50 years ago when sociologists were talking about this, they used to ex distinguish between what they called um, structural mobility yep. and exchange room yep. mobility. And I think these are core issues, I would say. The idea is structural is there's a change in the economic uh, occupational structure. There's and yep. in particular yep. in the 50s and 60s, big expansion in yep. professional type jobs. Yep. These are just openings, people slotted into them. People moved up yep. simply because they were more of that type of- Or now computers and, and now- that, it, that itself was, and I think this is a core issue. To what extent is the changes in the overall occupational structure uh, driving this mobility? And of course, now it looks like that is not happening. There is not so much uh, structural mobility, but maybe, uh, and that is the reason why perhaps you don't see so much mobility is because there, is, there isn't this expansion in pro professional jobs. I mean, you could just look at all the kids who are now getting graduating from universities, getting uh, you know getting degrees, but now it's devalued uh, what sort of uh, jobs they're going into, and so there's less mobility in this measure. But unless you somehow I just identify that, uh, those I two things. Yep. You're just saying there's less mobility now. What is isn't particularly that's what's sometimes it's just simply because you know, some people are staying in the same occupations, but they're not they're not going ahead in the same way that they were in the past. But I, I'm just saying that the, the idea here that you have this overall headline and then all the kind of different sub-measures allows you to kind of do the intersections <clears throat> with groups of folks to understand what's going on. Do the estimation if you want to do it that way. But my point is, actually, it isn't just that. It also is, for my kids in particular, change in preference. They don't want to have that much income. They're happy to have less income, but they want more free time. They want more ability to find themselves, et cetera. 
Uh, so preference changes have occurred over the last five or six, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, or maybe it's something even longer. How do you measure that? But that is probably part of what's going on now, at least in the U.S. and my kids. Uh, question, I mean, can you... should we have kids, uh, people on? Yeah. Was Paolo also answering the question? Were you stretching? No, no, I was, I was, I wanted to ask. Uh, okay, I'll make three basic and six questions. So what, what, what would be the shape of the... Uh, curve if there was a, a proportional growth. I mean, proportional growth. So there, there would be no Great question. And so I think that's a wonderful question. Let me not answer it off the cuff. I could probably figure it out, but I'm going to hold off and say, uh, okay. no, that's a great question. It'd be a, a good discussion for your discussion as well in terms of growth, right? Well, right? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it, with your with your measure show yep. that everybody is socially mobile if growth happens for everyone? If it does, that would be a wonderful thing. It, it would be a wonderful yeah, thing. Right. Right. I was just wondering whether you could present it as difference between uh, a benchmark with the uh, It could be, yes. And in fact, I thought of that as a benchmark of a particular level of expected growth yeah. uniformly, and then what, whether it makes it or not relative to that benchmark. Entirely could be teach more to, to policymakers. Now you see yep. the gap between what you would expect with a proportional growth. Yep. Agreed. I'll there. Okay. Uh, on, online there. Is that what I know she has a question. question in oh, excellent. Okay, wonderful. Then we can just keep it in this room here, private between us. Well, I'm just wondering about what you're just saying now. If everybody, suppose just one generation, everyone's income goes up 10%. Mm -hmm. You think that that was good because of mobility? Because in other ways, relative mobility is actually, there's no and there's no changing in the distribution. And that's essentially a, indeed why measures. there are different mobility measures to measure different things, relative mobile, mobility, <clears throat> right? relative mobility, uh, normalized relative mobility. I mean, you have different types of mobility and that, ain't gonna, that isn't gonna change. But what's interesting is you could in fact plug that into the structure by using ranks or using relative incomes and see the same thing. I've looked at the absolute and I've justified it bit because it seems important to me in the US context in particular, but many other contexts. But you could use different data to derive different forms of mobility. They don't have to be absolute. So James, have you looked at any other subgroups other than the ethnic ones that you showed no. yet? No, in fact, there's a recent paper that my co-author has put out with the census that may have done so. But I, I'm afraid I have not uh, looked at it. I was going to say a few, a few things. I mean, one is um, on, on Tony's last point, this really is absolute or mobility is moving, Gary would call it, rather than, right. than mobility is origin independence or any of that. So exactly. that, that's just to be to be clear on that. Yes, I think you, you were clear right. on that. But right. therefore, it would measure something as very well, even if it had no re-ranking uh, because right. it's not looking at origin of the country. That's great. No. And it will and also other, register other, potential re-ranking yeah. as well. The other the other uh, question that Tony had asked earlier about structure and exchange mobility, yep. in a sense, is actually, I think, I was going to say that first, but let me be polite. One really nice thing about your measure as opposed to Gary, to, to, to Gary's, because I think if I wanted a, syn a synthesis number, I would want upward mobility minus downward. But you know, you're looking at it in this other way, that's fine. But for structure and exchange, you really want to see who's going up and who's going down. That's right. And in that sense, you can do, you know, profiles. So uh, I said profiles as, as, uh, as we were talking about the other day with yep. a different context here. You know, you see who are these people going down, who's right. going out. And then finally, just building on Paolo's question, what's on this axis is not ranks, right? It's English. No, it's not it's not ranks. That's it's very different. Then then wouldn't it be the answer to to, I don't want to push on that, but the answer to this question of ranks, and yeah, it would kind of trace the density function. Yes. It would trace the density function plus whatever lambda is. That's right. You, I believe there's a relationship between last week's yeah. and this week's. Yeah. And I just haven't had a chance to compare the two. Okay. Other questions? Okay, come, someone be tough. Tell me something you thought was awful. <laughs> Tony, you're always able to do that. Go ahead. Oh, no, okay, great. Well, I think not there. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you so much to everybody for coming. It was a pleasure hosting the seminar. And in particular, thank you to James for um, his presentation.
Okay. If you would like to know more about IAI and the LSE, please visit our website and learn about the upcoming events. Um, and in particular, keep track of when they are given current circumstances and also sign up to our newsletter if you wish. Until next time, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Much. Thank you.